uh, I'll get the recording going here. Um, the uh, yeah, it's a it's a small group today, Tyler, because um, Alex is taking Guillermo over to get a vaccination in Perry, so they're on the road right now. Okay. But uh, let's see, and who else do we got? Anyway, small group today. Right. But uh, <clears throat> we'll, just, we'll just press on, and they'll have to check the recording. Um, I, I was saying uh, about the about the text. I, I'm probably going to go back and revise the or add to probably the uh, the e m section now I, I chose one way of i just fixed the gauge uh, so you're working in a two-dimensional space but when you look at interactions that's awkward uh, you you really want something that's covariant and so there are other uh, gauge fixing methods where you, you add a term to the Lagrangian that, that breaks the gauge invariance in one way or another. And uh, you go ahead and solve that. And what that means is that when you calculate the green function, you've got an, you've got an invertible thing. And I'm still sorting out the details of this and you know we'll write it up once I figure the best way to present it. Ultimately, <clears throat> for non-abelian gauge theories, you use something called BRST uh, for initials. Um, that uh, I, I think it has to do with taking a, um, uh, you, you set up a fiber bundle and you take a quotient by the volume of the fibers, essentially, uh, something along those lines. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can. Uh, say something more about that in the notes if I uh, end up working that up. But um, <clears throat> we may end up working in a different gauge uh, than the one we chose to do E and M. Uh, maybe the simplest is the Feynman gauge where, where you, um, instead of that projection matrix, you, you, you just use the Minkowski metric. Um, so um, you're, you're keeping some modes of the uh, electromagnetic field that aren't, aren't real. And then you, on the space of states, you have to uh, impose an additional constraint. So your space of states is annihilated by uh, some of the operators and that, that enforces the gauge freedom. But, <clears throat> I'm, I'm still sorting all that out. Uh, presumably, we'll be able to make sense of it before we need to use it. So what we were doing uh, last time was developing the, uh, the Green's theorem for space time. And we had gotten up to, I have to dig a marker out from under the cat here. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. So, yeah, we we've, we've written something like. Oh, wait a sec. Uh, yeah, D four Y. Something like this. Y minus X minus the other way around. Ah, there's Kenneth. Okay, so uh, this, oh, well, this, this wasn't quite, no, oh, Eli, all right, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting a crowd. Okay, now we've got everybody we expect. Um, Alex and uh, Guillermo uh, won't be here today. They're, uh, Alex is driving Guillermo to Perry to get a vaccination. <clears throat> so let me recall quite what we did. Um, yeah, we, we, we wrote, basically we, we wrote phi uh, is equal to the four dimensional integral of rho. We started here um, times g and then uh, 
this was equal to the wave equation Uh, now, that operator on g times phi minus g times that operator on phi. So we started with this. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, we, we broke it into a space plus a timepiece. And we used Green's theorem on the, the spatial part. So we were able to write the, the spatial part, the Laplacian here, the, the M cancels here. So you have time derivatives in the Laplacian. And we're able to, to go ahead and integrate that. So uh, this, is, this is the leftover time part. And then that is equal to um, uh, let's see. <laughs> we, we were a couple steps into this. I've lost it. Let's see. So, uh, where do we go with this? Um, so yeah, on the left. Yeah. So, so we, we took We, we took the difference of these two, sorry. The, diff the difference of those two. Yeah, I could put it on this side, but um, this is, uh, these, these are just manifestly equal because box plus M squared G is a delta. You integrate that, that gave you the phi and then box plus M squared phi is rho and that gives you this term. So, so this, is, this is just true by the definition, by your wave equation for phi and by the definition of G. <clears throat> then we separated the time and space parts. Uh, on, on this side, the M cancels and uh, the Laplacian is the second time derivative like I started writing here, um, or the D'Alembertian is the second time derivative uh, minus the Laplacian. And the Laplacian we can write as a divergence over three space and integrate uh, with the divergence theorem to write as a surface integral. Now, uh, let's see, I don't see where we come back to that, but um, yeah, where do we come back to that? That anyway, let's. Uh, I, I want to work with this time part. This we can we can write as a time derivative of phi d zero g minus g d zero phi, because when the d zero hits the phi here, it cancels with it hitting g there, and then you get the second derivative term here and the second derivative term there. And this kind of thing, I think we had just defined this at the end. If we have um, two functions and any sort of derivative you like with a double arrow, what we mean is apply the derivative to G and then subtract the expression with the derivative applied to F. <coughs> if these are fermionic, then you don't switch the order there, but otherwise, uh, that's fine. So I can write uh, this expression that way. And uh, then we're going to um, you know, we, we, we do the time integration. So uh, the, the D4 I think, I think it's d for y here. Um, the time derivative we can integrate so we get d3y <clears throat> at, let's say, uh, a, a future time um, phi d0 both directions g minus 
uh, uh, let me, uh, this, this is some three surface uh, at some future time. This is some three surface at some past time. And uh, then D3, Y, same, same thing. D0, G. <coughs> Okay, so then what do we do? This is, this is not a calculation I've worked through 20 times like I have some calculations. So now, uh, so I've just, gotta, I've just gotta follow the notes on this one. Um, so for the field, we, we have those first two terms. We have phi of uh, x is is the integral is this way? Yeah, d4x rho, d4y, rho of y, g of y minus x. And then a surface term. Um, the surface term has become this uh, because that's the leftover time stuff here. So we're subtracting um, basically the, the difference between these two integrals. So sigma plus minus sigma minus um, acting on <clears throat> D3Y phi D0 double arrow G. And let me check. Yeah, that's what I've got here. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, uh, what's not here is the Laplacian part of the solution. So uh, what, we're, what we're assuming is uh, vanishing fields at infinity. Um, so vanishing phi, vanishing grad phi off at infinity, the fields have dispersed enough that they're negligible. Uh, that, that gets rid of the Laplacian surface term. So now, in order to, to solve this, we, um, we need the green function. Now the green function, uh, let's see. So uh, yeah, so this, this gives us phi in terms of some initial and final, you know, far distant uh, um, initial values and the, the distribution of stuff. Now, I think what this is gonna become, you know, in, in these regions, we'll be talking about free fields. So uh, this part of uh, our expression for phi will be able to write in terms of the free field solutions we've already gotten. Uh, this part is going to be that confined region where the interaction occurs. So we'll be able to perturbatively expand that, uh, that source term. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now the green function we've already worked through. We, and uh, the form that we're going to use it the most is uh, we found g of x and y. We inverted this Fourier transform. And now uh, this normalization, right? The, the normalization I've been using on Fourier transforms is uh, one over the square root of two pi for each dimension for each direction. So the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform always had that same factor. And it turns out that's not the most convenient thing to use in um, evaluating these matrix elements. It's nice to just put two pi to the fourth uh, on, on these functions. So uh, I'll write this. This is what I wrote before, but uh, in fact, uh, we're gonna be putting the, the full factor of two pi on on the Fourier transform and not, uh, and then no factor if we invert this. And then here we have just, uh, well, the yeah, exponential e to the minus i, four dimensional k dot um, x minus y over <coughs> k squared minus m squared plus or minus i epsilon. And uh, we just have a reminder here. 
uh, that we're gonna we're gonna offset the poles off of the real axis. Um, you know, we we actually went through that calculation, and what we showed is that we we end up with uh, depending which way we offset it. Uh, we found we had a G positive energy and positive time solution, and we had a we had negative energy solutions going backwards in time. And the that's that's the Feynman choice for the um, for the green function, which you know when when we're doing it in this four dimensional picture and uh, using it over and over to calculate um, matrix transition amplitudes, um, it's called a propagator. Uh, you know, there, there are various terms for these things. Uh, <clears throat> you can show that a, a state at, um, uh, at later time and place uh, can be written as, um, <clears throat> well, bas basically one of these operators integrated past the, the field at an earlier time. That's, that's what a green function does. But, you know, this is also the form that you get for a heat kernel in statistical mechanics, where you look at the, the statistical evolution of some distribution. Uh, you, you have, uh, you know, K at X and T and at X naught and T naught. So some function which times the initial uh, state or function, distribution, whatever, gives you the thing at a later time. Uh, <clears throat> this is the general property of a green function or a heat propagator, uh, uh, sorry, a heat kernel or a propagator. So uh, we'll gradually evolve from calling these things greens functions to calling them uh, propagators. Now, this particular choice, uh, the sum of these two, in fact, you know, that'll be our green function. And uh, these are advanced and retarded. So the retarded solution is the usual one that um, positive energy, positive time, where uh, it was proportional to a step function in time so that the, the integration over the density uh, that I just erased, no, here, um, this integration over the density, uh, there's a, a step function in time that restricts this integral to earlier times so that the field at a given time depends only on uh, its past light cone, essentially. Uh, <clears throat> that's the retarded, uh, uh, the retarded green function. This would be the advanced green function where for a particle traveling backward in time, it depends on the future times. Uh, a common name for these, um, you know, what, uh, well, common name, it's basically what Feynman called them. Um, so Feynman propagators, uh, he uses delta retarded and advanced. But these, these are basically these two green functions that we've already looked at back in chapter five, I think it was, uh, when in the discussion of, uh, <clears throat> of antiparticles. So now, um, oh, we're gonna do more of this. Uh, now, let me, oh boy. You know, this is delicate. I, would, I, I want to see that I can do this more justice than you'll get by just reading the notes. Um, if I take, if I take uh, the product of the, the equation for a green function, yeah, I, I have a feeling what I'm this part that's coming up is basically uh, saying Green's function, Green's theorem again. Um, we can, we, yeah, we can apply something like Green's theorem to two Green, green functions. So if I have G1 
uh, box plus m squared on G2. Uh, that's that's going to give a delta function here. So delta of say x minus z times G1. And now I can interchange G1 and G2, right? G2 box plus m squared on G1. And that's going to be a delta of uh, probably x minus y. Yeah, x minus y. So if, if this one is if this one is y and this one is z, both with x, <clears throat> then here we have x minus y and g2. So, uh, and then this is g1 of y and this is g2 of z. Now, what are we going to do with that? We're going to integrate it over, um, let's see, what have I done here? Oh, then, yeah, then we integrate over x. So, um, huh. Let's see, I want to, I want to subtract these two expressions and integrate over x. Yeah, so what's going to happen? So on this side, we're going to have g of um, y minus z minus g of z minus y. Uh, now that's g1 and this is g2. Did I get that right? Uh, yeah, y minus, no, let me exactly backwards. z minus y here, and I don't think it matters. Um, I want to see there and uh, what what we're trying to do here I think is to relate yeah we're, we're going to let one of these g's be the advanced and one be the retarded and that's going to let us relate them so one is just going to be equal to the other with uh, with inverted um, uh, with, I think there's a sign difference yeah so the retarded um, propagator at x is the same as the advanced propagator at minus x. So we can use this argument to prove that. Um, on the other side, we're, we're integrating this expression. And uh, with vanishing boundary conditions at infinity, the fields die off at infinity, uh, spatial infinity. Uh, we just have, um, uh, on this side, we just have this difference of two spatial integrals of uh, d3x and um, this this time arrow. Yeah, uh, g1, d0, g2. So <clears throat> basically the result that we just muddled through. Uh, and now we want to let uh, g1 be retarded the retarded and G2 to be the advanced. And now, what does that say? So the difference between the retarded and the advanced solutions, delta R minus delta A, is going to be whatever we can uh, say about this one. But um, let's see, the the surface integral, um, yeah, okay, ha. yeah. So we're putting in advanced and retarded over here, but if we're talking about positions y between um, between these two initial the initial and final surfaces, then uh, for um, Let's see, on the future surface, the retarded green function vanishes, and on the past surface, the advanced green function vanishes. So, so this vanishes um, on one of these boundaries in, any, in every case. And uh, that means that we end up with, uh, you know, what do we end up with? Yeah, uh, yeah, is that it right? One of these van vanishes. Uh, on on uh, these surfaces, 
one vanishes on one service, one vanishes on the other. So the whole thing is zero. And that tells us that uh, G, G1 at X is G2 at minus X. So that's, that's the basic result we're after here. So retarded at X is advanced at minus X. And that, that'll let us get away with using just, just one of the green functions. Okay, all right. So uh, then we have, yeah, we have Green's theorem and we can write, uh, now, we, now we write Green's theorem, um, just look back a few pages. Uh, so phi is equal to the integral of rho times the Green function minus the surface term. Uh, and now we can, we can write that entirely in terms of the retarded green function, just interchanging, interchanging the sign of the x minus y into y minus x. So uh, this lets us write the full solution in terms of the retarded green function. Uh, then now, okay, so that solution, uh, probably, I, probably I should write that down. So now we've got phi of x as an integral rho of y times the retarded propagator of at x minus y for y. And then we have, uh, yeah, now, now a single initial surface, sigma minus, and then we have probably the normal derivative, what is it, the time, the time derivative thing. Yeah, this time operator going both ways, d3y, retarded, phi of y. Yeah, okay, and now that, um, yeah, uh, and yeah, in both cases, this is the retarded evaluated at x minus one. So that, that lets us get rid of this double integral in our solution. And <clears throat> so what we're actually getting to here is defining our, our in and out states. And let's see. So what we, what we want to do, all right, this is, this is a, some, uh, some, early y, but we basically want to let that go to minus infinity, right? We, we want our initial state to go to the very far past where we're basically talking about uh, <coughs> um, a, uh, a free solution. And if we apply box plus m squared to the, uh, uh, to this phi at minus infinity then. Uh, all right, so uh, we're, we're including nothing here. Rho is non-zero in some interaction region. So we lose this term. We just get this surface term at past infinity. And that's gonna be the effect of this operator acting on the retarded green function, which is delta of del four of x minus y, um, t zero y. But now that, uh, let's see, that's, no, well, that's, that's zero because um, x is somewhere in the bulk, All right? So, so because, because this delta vanishes uh, everywhere away from, past infinite y, that delta function is zero. And this uh, becomes the asymptotic, the, the asymptotic past wave function is a free wave function. It satisfies the free wave equation with zero on this side because no sources have come in to play yet. That's, that's basically what we're doing here. <laughs> I probably need to run through this argument like half a dozen times and it'll be a lot smoother.
but uh, the you know this this distinction between the in states and the out states. So this is this is going to be this is going to be our our in state, uh, and uh, basically this is to show that that's well defined. Um, then to to get to the out states. Uh, we've, we've handled the surface term. So we push this surface term all the way back to minus infinity. And so our phi of x is going to be uh, let's see. Yeah, so okay. Now, now we need to define an out state. Um, we, can, we can write, yeah. Okay, same argument, but now the phi out state uh, is what we get with the advanced green function uh, acting on, on future infinity. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, now we let the time go to future infinity. We use the advanced green function. And um, so uh, this will vanish at future infinity and uh, so phi at plus infinity is going to be our uh, vacuum solution, and that is our out state. Okay, one wonders if this couldn't be said more simply, but um, yeah, there's there's probably a certain rigor that would be lost if we said it more simply. Um, uh, you can you can read through this argument in the notes. I'm in section just finished section nine point two. So, what this establishes by applying Green's theorem in four dimensions is that we can define in and out states that satisfy the vacuum equation, and we'd really like to be able to express the uh, our matrix element in terms of those together with some, uh, some interactions that occur in a restricted area. And so now what we're gonna do, yeah, uh, yeah, here we go, scattering matrix. So we, we, know, we know what time evolution looks like. It's, uh, Uh, exponential of the Hamiltonian integrated. And it's, um, yeah, the, the, full, the full expression for the time evolution operator of some state, A of t, is e to the time ordered exponential I over h bar integral of the Hamiltonian operator t prime dt prime um, acting on the initial state. Now, uh, we, we can actually, uh, we can actually write that uh, depending on whether these guys commute or not, we can write this as uh, just the Hamiltonian times t minus t naught. Um, if, if the Hamiltonian is time independent, say. Uh, now, um, if we want to go to some final state, then this is going to be, all right, let, let me just write it here. So it's some final state, then we have t final minus t initial. So going from one, uh, from an initial state to a final state, we're interested in the uh, um, the probability amplitude for that to occur. So the thing we're going to be interested in for uh, many moons, in fact, is that operator sandwiched between 
the initial and final states. Now, these states are uh, multiple, multi-particle states. I'll get more specific about that pretty soon. Uh, the, um, you know, to preserve the normalization of these states, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. I suddenly talked, I suddenly started talking about the scattering matrix. Uh, you know, basically this thing is the scattering matrix. Um, and what we want is for uh, these states to be normalized, which means that uh, S needs to be, if the state's gonna stay normalized, the scattering matrix needs to be a unitary transformation. and and. We've written this as a unitary transformation in each case. Uh, what we do in particle scattering frequently is <clears throat> we, we're interested in the particles that actually do interact. And uh, that's often a small portion of them, but uh, it makes sense because of that to write the scattering matrix as, uh, is it plus or minus one plus I T. Uh, the T's, the I is a convenience here, um, but uh, we're, we're interested in the effect of T here. Um, particles that don't interact are, are gonna give us something, uh, they're, they're gonna give us something from this one, right? So if, if we have an initial state uh, initial state that's uh, say a bunch of particles like this and uh, and it, then if the final state has the same particles then all right we're going to see something around this one um, if we only consider particles that have actually interacted then we can expect all of these to be different and then the expectation between these states is uh, the, the one gives zero because all of these are different from all of those and they're different, they're different particle states. Those are the ones we're looking at. So we will be assuming explicitly in some of the calculations that the, the final particle states and the initial particle states are completely distinct uh, momentum. Um, if it's scattered, you know, the momentum is somewhat different, so it's a different state. Uh, now, this is not perturbative, okay? So that means that S dagger S is gonna be one plus I T, um, one minus I T, one plus I T. Um, that's gotta be one. So this is gonna be one plus, uh, sorry, dagger T dagger here. Um, so we're gonna get uh, T minus that, sorry, I, T minus T dagger. I have plus a question of curiosity T. when you get a second, yeah. Sorry, what? Sorry, uh, well, I was thinking about what you had said about yeah. the, uh, um, we can tell if a particle scattered, if its momentum is different. Yeah. Um, are we assuming that everything only collides at most once in that case? No, no, Th There's... things should scatter multiple times. I mean, there, there, there probably would be some isolated interactions where uh, something scatters multiple times and ends up with the same momentum it had in the beginning. A very rare event. Yeah, uh, that, negligible. I, I think we're safe calling that negligible. Cool. Um, you know, we're talking, not usually talking about many scatterings because uh, you know, we're, we're going to end up evaluating these things by drawing Feynman diagrams and drawing a Feynman diagram. You, you guys ever drawn Feynman diagrams? Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, say an electron emitting a photon, you introduce a vertex like that. And that happens with probability equal to the fine structure constant. So if you want to do fifth or sixth order perturbation theory, you need to draw all diagrams that have five or six of these things. So, 
you know, you have something come in, emit a photon, pair produce, annihilate, scatter off some other particle here, uh, emit another photon and absorption there. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's the sixth order diagram. That'll take you three months on a supercomputer to evaluate. So we're not going much higher than this. Well, uh, we're certainly not assuming just single collisions because that would just be the yeah, simplest. Yeah, no, it's not a diagrams. single collision, but the probability that those two momenta equal those two is negligible. Yeah, I see. Okay, so yeah, so this is the kind of thing we're going to end up doing. It's it's a bit of a story to get there. I've been <laughs> working on these steps. I don't know when when did I last distribute that? I th you know probably the last two weeks. I've spent most of my time writing this last thirty pages. Um, so please, you know, let me know if parts are really murky or uh, just wrong, uh, anything like that. So, um, because it, it could be, you know, this is uh, this is sort of a second draft. I, I have a set of notes from a version of this class I gave about ten years ago, where we we got pretty far into it and covered a lot of material, except that all I have are pictures of the blackboard and uh, video recordings of those classes, which I can't stand to listen to, you know, so I'm just um, basically writing all this de novo by referring to those pictures of the blackboard and then, uh, you know, looking up stuff to, to figure out, well, what was I really doing there? Um, so uh, anyway, these are the assumptions. Uh, it, it gets clearer once we actually start drawing these diagrams and computing the transition amplitudes. But uh, first, we have to um, we, we have to do a lot of work on these states because what we're going to do is turn these initial and final states into a bunch of operators, field operators, acting on the vacuum, and by going to the interaction picture halfway between Schrodinger and Heisenberg, we're, we're gonna make those free field operators. Um, maybe, I have to think about that. Maybe they're not free field operators. They're, they're field operators um, in the interaction picture. Uh, this, this gives us a, a funny condition, right? So the, um, the imaginary part of T, uh, this thing, is, is uh, basically minus T squared. T dagger T, I think. Is that right? Yeah, T dagger T. Um, so you have this condition that, that has to hold on the, the matrix. And I think it's for that reason. Um, a little later, I'm gonna introduce a, a normalization factor, uh, capital Z traditionally capital Z. I don't know why capital Z. It was probably the only letter left. But the, uh, the um, we'll, we'll stick in an additional thing for normalization. It, it's uh, until you get the quadratic order in these diagrams, it's just one. But uh, I believe we end up using it to satisfy this condition of unitarity. Um, but at some point, I'm going to stick in a Z. Uh, and you know, since it's perturbative, you know, you're you keep adding terms. You you have to um, you have to adjust the normalization of the states to be right. You know, that's that's all that's about. But now uh, the the um, the free states, the initial states, we can write as a bunch of creation operators on the vacuum. So. Uh, Let's do that. Doing here, how good? So our initial state is going to be a bunch of creation operators uh, with uh, yeah, uh, characterized by, let's say, uh, momentum and spin. and S2, and as many of these as you want to deal with at once, uh, oh, what did I go up to here? Oh, I did, okay, well, 
acting on the vacuum. And uh, fair enough to call that P1, P2, and S1, S2, whatever, whatever else we need in these states. Um, so uh, these are going to be uh, the, the, let's see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so if we can, if we compute this thing, then that's, that's going to be T and T dagger sandwiched between a bunch of things like this. So we're going to have a bunch of annihilation operators, T dagger T, and then a bunch of uh, creation operators between vacuum states. So now what do we do with this? We need to, we need to look at the Heisenberg and Schrodinger pictures. So um, in the Schrodinger picture, it's the states that evolve in time. In the Heisenberg picture, it's the operators that evolve in time. It's an active versus a passive representation. So are we in a fixed space and our vectors move around? Okay, it's big, it's a Hilbert space, but never mind. Or, you know, does that stay put in the, the, um, the, the basis vectors change? Um, you can do it either way, they're equivalent. So, uh, so a Schrodinger state Got some A at T, that's a Schrodinger state. And then we act on that with some operator. So uh, that might be some Schrodinger operator acting on some other Schrodinger state. Uh, let's, let's say, let's say this turns A of T into B of T. So there's the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and the time dependence here is given by uh, e to the minus i h t acting say on a of time zero to the Schrodinger state. So it's this operator that evolves the Schrodinger states in time. Now, what that means is for an operator, if we uh, if, if we if we want to um, write this all, uh, let's see. So on, on this side, we have um, IHT as well, B of zero. So if we look at how the operators evolve, I can invert this one and put it here, e to the plus IHT on O. Schrodinger minus I H T. And now that acts on some fixed states. Um, so <clears throat> the initial states are related then by this time dependent operator. And uh, let's see, how does this go? Um, Uh, okay. uh, hang on, let's see. So the, yeah, the Heisenberg, yeah, the Heisenberg operator, um, or the, the Heisenberg states, um, Heisenberg are, are given by undoing this transformation. So we're gonna act with uh, e to the plus i ht on the Schrodinger state. Which may or may not depend on time intrinsically. It, it could be that these states or these operators have some independent time time dependence built into them. But then, uh, let's see. So so now, um, if if we look at the Heisenberg B, uh, right? That's given by 
um, e to the IHT acting on the action of the operator on the, uh, the other Heisenberg state. Uh, let's see. All right, what am I doing? Uh, all right, I've got this now. I yeah, okay. So I want to write this this way. So this is e to the i h t. This state evolves uh, by the action of O uh, on a Schrodinger. But now I'm going to stick the identity in here, and this this will tell me how. This will give me O Heisenberg e to the i h T of Schrodinger. Now the identity I write is a pair of these in the I H T on A Schrodinger. There we go. Okay, and now this is the Heisenberg initial state, and this is what I mean by the Heisenberg operator. So this is the Heisenberg operator acting on the Heisenberg state, giving the, um, what was this? This was, this was, this was B. Right, B Schrodinger is OS acting on that. And then we have IHT. So this is B, B Heisenberg. So this defines our Heisenberg states. B Heisenberg is E to the IHT on B Schrodinger. B Schrodinger is O acting on A. We insert an identity and we find that um, this combination is the Heisenberg operator for O. The Heisenberg version of O is sandwiched between these two time, time translations. Okay, yeah, that's right. Good. Now, let's see, it could be that the operators are independently uh, time dependent. One thing this means is that uh, eigenvalues change. So uh, these operators, okay, they've probably become time dependent. And um, so they're not the same operator at a later time. So if we have uh, uh, at, at some at some time zero, suppose we have O Heisenberg uh, A is a times is, is an eigenstate. Um, this may not hold at a later time. Sorry, there. This operator has changed in time, so it may not be the same operator. May not have the same eigenstates. So far, so good. Now, ultimately, what we're going to do? Let me let me see where we do this. Oh, um, okay. Looks looks to me like it's way later. Yeah, and we've we've got we've got a bit to go here before we get to the um, a, a different picture. You know. What, what we're going to do ultimately is we're going to work with states akin to this, but what we'll work with, well, this, this will be the free Hamiltonian. So we'll look at the time evolution of uh, states as if they're free, um, but then uh, we write the full Hamiltonian as the free Hamiltonian plus an interaction Hamiltonian. And then we handle that interaction Hamiltonian perturbatively, uh, changing some of these interaction picture states. So we'll, we'll have an interaction picture. Well, this, this would be a state in the interaction picture where we've evolved it with a piece of the Hamiltonian. Um, it's halfway between Schrodinger and Heisenberg, but it turns out to be the right sort of thing for handling scattering problems. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if you guys are struggling to follow this, uh, well, I'm not far behind you. 
uh, <laughs> you know, this, this is, this is convoluted and I really have not gone through these calculations repeatedly. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at this point getting you pieces we need to pull the whole thing together. And, um, let's see the, the next thing we need, uh, are the, um, creation and annihilation operators uh, for the in and out fields. Oh, now let me see. And yeah, we're going to need these. Oh, boy. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're going to, we're going to take these states and, you know, we're going to write them as things acting on a vacuum. So we need to know what to do with these operators. Um, uh, we need to express those in a, in a, uh, the simplest way we can. So now let's look at our solutions for creation and annihilation operators. Because there's a cute thing that happens with these. Um, just, you know, for, for a few more pages, we're putting Schrodinger and Heisenberg aside. But uh, when we come back to it, we'll be looking at this interaction picture. So, um, the creation and annihilation operators. We found a solution in terms of the, uh, let's see, and I, I, we're going to be dealing with scalar fields for a while. We're going to be looking at Klein-Gordon fields uh, for, for the next 30 pages of the book or so. Um, and through a number of Feynman diagrams and even getting some Feynman rules for scalar fields before we move on to Dirac and QED. So A, the annihilation operator of K and T is a Fourier transform of, uh, let's see, root two and then we had phi and i over omega and pi but pi here well i write this pi but uh remember pi is just um pi is just phi dot for the scalar field. And then we have e to the i k dot x, uh, four dimensional inner product uh, d3x. And then for a dagger, okay, it's the same, but we have a minus sign here, e to the minus i k x there and I think everything else is the same. So yeah, just uh, just flip all the signs on all the eyes. And um, the, the thing that is uh, gonna make us able to condense this nicely is that uh, pi is just phi dot. So if we write this out, Let's, let's just continue with A here. I can, I can write A as two pi to the three halves, root omega over two. Uh, then um, we're gonna write this as, uh, now, yeah, let me see. I wanna, I wanna bring in the omega. Yeah, so I want to write this as one over two omega times omega. So I have omega phi hat here, and then um, plus i uh, d zero phi for this one, and then e to the i k dot x d three x. Okay, and now um, I can write 
I can write this omega as a time derivative of, of this term, of the exponential. So I can write this as, um, what do I need? Minus I D zero of E to the I K dot X times phi um, plus I E to the I K dot X D zero phi and uh, D three X. And so let's see, if I pull out an I, then this is one of those double arrow things. So uh, D3X over root two pi, uh, two omega, sorry. And now I've pulled out the I, so I can write this as E to the I K dot X D zero double arrow Phi. So, uh, so this term is when the, the D zero hits the phi and then we subtract when it hits the IKX. Um, I've already pulled out the, the I, so we just have the minus sign left and we can write it with the double arrow. Okay, so, uh, then uh, what, a dagger, let's see, positive I, yeah, this is right, good. Um, and a, a dagger we can do very similarly. Uh, oh, and this is where we stick in this, the Z. So a dagger, we're gonna have a minus I, we have two pi to the, well, I haven't changed this normalization yet, but that'll change. Then we have root, um, two omega z. So I, I'm sticking in this additional normalization. <clears throat> and then d3x, so I pulled out the root two, and then we just have this double arrow thing on, uh, all right, if I'm writing a dagger, this is gonna be e to the minus ikx. Dot x, and d0 fine, like that. And, and A is the same thing, except you've got plus I here and plus I there. Um, that's, that's what I've written down below. Uh, and yeah, then uh, correct the normalization. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put a capital Z down there. Okay. Now these are are in and out states. Um, yeah, we, we use these operators to create the in and out states. So um, what's next? Tricks with transitions. Yeah, so the next thing, the next thing we do is we, we're gonna write operators like this, acting on the vacuum state to to produce our, our in states. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> and then we're gonna use the fact that our in and out states don't have any things in common. So if I've got a dagger acting on an in state, I can, I can add or subtract the same a, uh, a out acting on the out state because that's gonna give zero because that, that, uh, that state is not in that final state. So here, here's what I'm saying. Um, so if, if my in state uh, has, has some A dagger of K acting on the vacuum, can, can you see this? Am I writing large enough? Um, then uh, I, can, I can write, so this, this is defining an in state. I can write a out minus a dagger in, or well, probably the other way around, in, in dagger minus a out um, 
act, acting on that. So I can write this as that um, because when, when this A acts on the, uh, wait a minute, no, A in. Let me, let me, let me check it. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. No. I, yeah. So this, which one now? No, I'm confused. But the point is, if I if I add the same, if I add the dagger of the same operator to to the um, the operator on the state, it's it's not going to do anything. So. Yeah, if, if I write, all right, is this. A dagger out. Uh, now let's see, so which of these? Yeah, so if, if I have a final state here and I let the, the dagger of these guys act that way, uh, a, this becomes an annihilation operator and there is no such uh, state at the final. So explicitly using this idea that the in and out states are completely scattered, uh, this will annihilate that. And so I can, I can replace, um, I've got my ins and outs backwards here, but uh, I, I could write these two equivalently because this isn't gonna do anything. Now that's that's a trick we're going to use, um, but let me let me take it a step at a time here. Um, now, yeah, this is let's see. So, um, yeah. Let's let's look at our transition amplitude. And this is the thing that we're actually trying to compute. So we have uh, n particles going out. Then we have our our uh, non-trivial part of the scattering matrix. Um, well, no, not yet. Uh, this, this, this is some t final. Then the amplitude. Uh, do I want to write this with p's or k's? Q's. Then. M particles in the final state, and uh, that's that's a time initial. Okay, all right. This is what we want to compute, right? We've got M particles coming in. We've got N particles going out at asymptotic uh, locations where we're talking about free fields. Then we write this one as p one through p n t final. And then a dagger of Q1 acting on all the rest, Q2 up to QM and TI. Okay, and now we're gonna put in uh, the formula I just erased for a dagger and manipulate that. Um, Yeah, that's just what we're doing. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get this um, amplitude for a dagger, where we had a minus i over two pi to the three halves root um, two omega capital Z, and then yep, that's right. And now we insert this D3X. So we have the, the P's here at T final, nothing's changing there. 
then this becomes integral d3x. And then we have the, the double derivative e to the minus i k alpha x alpha times d0 both ways. Uh, the field operator and the, um, the initial state without Q1. So, uh, sorry, this is going to, uh, let's call this Q1 alpha here. So, um, we're creating a state with wave vector Q1, the initial. Okay, there we go. Uh, that's our that's our a dagger. All right, and then um, all right that uh, uh, we have to we have to keep this operator in, but um, this uh, right this part can can move outside the state. So basically, we've got uh, this uh, final state bra. Uh, a time derivative of a field operator and an initial state bra, where from the initial state, we've extracted one of the momenta and written it in terms of this uh, integral. And now um, we're gonna take this, uh, let's see, uh, we want the limit of this is uh, that, uh, T initial goes back to um, minus infinity. So now uh, here's where we can insert, um, instead of just this A dagger here, uh, that's, that's an in state, A dagger in. Um, I can subtract A, now let me be sure I'm doing the right thing, yeah. I can subtract a dagger out. So sandwich that in here. Now a dagger out on the in state becomes an annihilation operator a out. And this is still with Q1. So uh, when, when I take the adjoint and let this act on the uh, future state, it's going to annihilate it because there is no Q1 in this list because everything is scattered. There we go. That's that's how we're using that trick. And now, um, uh, we write the whole thing in terms of second time derivatives. So we're going to we're going to insert um, we're going to insert an integral over t times d d t, or call that d zero, uh, because that operator is close enough to one for physics. <laughs> um, and that, that's, going to, uh, that's going to boost this to a four-dimensional integral. Um, and we're going to have a second time derivative acting here. And uh, a second time derivative is going to let us turn this back into uh, a Klein-Gordon operator. So let me... Uh, let me try and do that. And I think, you know, that's about what we'll be able to do today. But um, so uh, all of this equals, um, so minus i over stuff. And now we have d4x. And uh, we can pull out e to the minus i uh, q1 dot x here. And then um, uh, we, we have a d0 of everything where this includes all of the p's. And then um, what else is inside? So we have d0 of phi hat, and we have Q2 through QM here. So uh, D0 on this, um, remember this, this is a double arrow. 
So D zero on the double arrow, when the, this D zero hits the exponential, we're gonna get a term that cancels. So it, it only survives um, as a Galaxian. We get a D zero, we get a D zero squared. So this is gonna turn D zero, uh, let me do D zero of either minus I Q one dot X D zero I hat minus D zero either minus I Q dot X um, phi hat. Okay, that, so that's what we're getting. So when this D zero hits that, it cancels the D zero hitting this. So we're gonna get uh, D zero squared on phi hat here with this exponential and minus D zero on e to the minus I Q dot X by there. And that, uh, that, that pure waveform um, satisfies a wave equation. So uh, this, this D zero squared here is pulling down a, a Q zero, I Q zero squared. Um, but Q zero squared equals Q squared plus M squared like this. And so uh, let's see, I squared is minus one. So what we get, what we get from that second bit is a plus uh, Q squared plus M squared uh, times phi hat. And then, um, over here, we pull out the IQ dot X and we have a D zero squared phi hat. Uh, and now I have to think about exactly how we do this. We're gonna, we're gonna turn this into the Klein-Gordon operator. Um, and uh, I apologize, but I have, to, I have another meeting right now. So I'll have to bounce out of here. Yeah, okay. So yeah, um, you know, I, sh I should do this part. You guys, you know, have things you have to get to and we are out of time. So uh, yeah, I'll pick up slightly earlier than this and uh, redo this calculation right here. Uh, I think that'd be a good place to, to pick up next time. So uh, yes, go about your things. I'll stay and answer questions if you like. And we'll, uh, you know, we're, we're halfway through this. We'll, we'll get there. Um, we have to do this with each momentum. We're going to have a product of all these wave operators. So <laughs> it's, there's a little ways to go yet, but you know, this is the, this is the tricky bit. Okay. So I'll see you guys. Uh, have a, have a good uh, week. Tyler, see you next you? week. Yeah. Well, we'll see you next week. Yeah. See you. All right. Uh, let's stop this recording.